Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring research into the Buddhist concept of emptiness. My guest is Dr. William Van Gordon, who lectures and conducts research on the psychology of Buddhist meditation at the University of Derby in England. He was a Buddhist monk for 10 years and received monastic ordinations in various Buddhist schools, including the higher ordination within the Theravada Buddhist tradition. William sits on the editorial board for various academic journals, including Mindfulness and Mindfulness and Compassion. He is internationally recognized as an expert in the research and practice of mindfulness and Buddhist meditation. William has over 100 academic publications, including in leading refereed medical and psychology journals. He is co-editor of two anthologies, Mindfulness and Buddhist-Derived Approaches in Mental Health and Addiction, and The Buddhist Foundation of Mindfulness. This is an internet interview, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, William. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Nice to be with you again, Jeff. You've done some very interesting research. In fact, I gather you've spent most of your career looking at mindfulness as a Buddhist uh, meditative practice. Uh, Today, we're going to look at a a different practice known as emptiness. Uh, Can you sort of distinguish for our viewers uh, the difference between emptiness and mindfulness? Sure. Em- emptiness and mindfulness, they, they really fall into two, two separate categories of meditation. Mindfulness is more to do with concentrating the mind, whereas emptiness meditation is more to do with using that concentration in order to investigate the mind and investigate phenomena. So, uh, why is it called emptiness? It sounds like if you're engaged in investigating the mind itself, you it would be a kind of fullness rather than emptiness. Yes, in fact, um, emptiness is just one rendering um, of of the the principle or the concept as it was introduced throughout the Buddhist literature, um, and it. It, it really means that any given phenomena, including ourselves, does not exist um, independently and that therefore it's empty of, of an independently existing self. Yet at the same time, by default, that means that it's full of all other phenomena. So personally, I, I'm not 100% comfortable with with the term emptiness, it doesn't quite capture the idea. It, could, it almost has some negative connotations attached to it. But um, emptiness can equally mean fullness. That's very interesting. Uh, I assume that emptiness is somehow also related to the Buddhist concept of nirvana, which I, I hear people describe as somehow akin to emptiness. In many respects, yes. The, the idea is that once we're able to let go of of a strong attachment to self, to me, to mine, and I, that that opens our perspective such that we can embrace and and experience much more of of reality. So that was that would be where the nirvana link begins to to come in. As soon as we let go of self, we can we can embrace. Other. We can embrace reality in, in its full extent. I understand that uh, the concept of mindfulness has now been uh, studied by the uh, psychology research community, the community of researchers such as yourself who study meditation. Uh, it's been studied for decades, and there are hundreds of studies talking about the benefits of mindfulness. But emptiness is also a meditative practice that has not been studied so extensively. 
Yes, that's that's right. In fact, we've really we've really seen a, a three phase evolution of meditation research, particularly in respect of Buddhist based meditation research. Um, starting in the late 1980s, a focus began to explore mindfulness in terms of the construct and its applications. I think at the turn of the century, then approximately 19 years ago, the focus moved to or, or began to explore techniques such as compassion and loving kindness meditation. But I think in the last five years, there's been a, a further evolution and um, there's now a keen interest in exploring principles such as emptiness and and non-self and non-attachment and how how we might be able to derive well-being from practicing those. Mm -hmm. Now you're an advanced uh, meditative practitioner yourself and a teacher of meditation. Uh, I assume from what you're telling me that uh, in order to really practice the emptiness as a meditative practice, one needs to have first uh, achieved a level of mastery over the mindfulness practices. To a degree, yes, but... Actually, emptiness is, it is an accessible concept, an accessible practice where it's taught correctly. Unfortunately, it often isn't taught correctly and there's a lot of confusion about the technique. But um, the idea that we don't exist independently, the idea that I'm breathing in your out-breath and you're breathing in my outbreath, and we're we're um, we're drinking, so to speak, the the rain and the rivers. The idea that there exists other in self and self in other. It's not so hard to to grasp with a little bit of time and care in explanation. I think people can and and do begin to um, familiarise themselves more with emptiness and how it relates to them. It sounds to me, the way you're describing it, that uh, this understanding of emptiness is very much akin to uh, the science of ecology, where we see that in the natural world, everything is interrelated. In, yeah, interrelatedness or interconnectedness is an important part of emptiness, but I think it does go one step further, um, because actually interconnectedness, although it's useful for didactic purposes uh, in terms of understanding emptiness it, it also introduces some limitations the idea that uh, two objects are connected um, really doesn't do emptiness justice emptiness is really implying that that phenomena are so connected there's even no boundary between them um, there, there's boundarylessness if you like and and actually trying to define where one object or phenomena finishes and another starts it, it is almost impossible. You conducted a lengthy uh, research investigation of advanced Buddhist meditators who were capable of entering into this state of emptiness. And I gather you spent a whole year just screening uh, participants in this study. Uh, I believe it was a a sister study to one we've already talked about, your study of meditation-induced near-death experience, which our viewers found uh, quite fascinating. So let's, let's talk a bit about how you were able to screen applicants for this study. So we decided to utilize a 12-month recruitment window, really just to make sure that we, we were comprehensive in terms of um, bringing in meditation practitioners from different Buddhist schools so that we, 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 we had a pan-Buddhist perspective, if you like. And also, um, we wanted to make sure that our participant sample were really um, eliciting a genuine emptiness experience. So that process took some time. Given that there aren't any standard measurements for uh, whether or not a Buddhist meditator is in that state of emptiness, how, how did you determine that these people were, in fact, capable of achieving that state? Yes, that's, that's a very good 
a question and that was um a, a, a potential challenge that we, we discussed before embarking on the study. And and we, we navigated our way around that potential issue via two by by implementing two steps. One was to use um, quite a selective recruitment process. So word of mouth um, was was the avenue we chose. We we, we targeted kind of known Buddhist teachers and asked them to pass the word on to other known Buddhist teachers um, who who would who would have a good understanding of whether um, an individual in 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 their circle of meditation practitioners was genuinely um, eliciting emptiness. And then we we administered a a screening questionnaire. Um, that was really intended to determine whether that individual's perception of emptiness was a good match in terms of uh, key Buddhist scriptures on emptiness. We weren't really interested in their in their knowledge or ability to regurgitate those scriptures. We were interested in their and that experiential understanding of the texts. Well, I understand that uh, in Buddhist practice, uh, sometimes a, a meditative uh, student or a, a young monk is going to be tested by a, a senior monk uh, in terms of their achievement. Uh, often this involves questions and answers or responses to Zen koans and, and things of that sort. Uh, did you use a- approaches like that? We didn't use um, Zen Zen koans. The the questionnaire really was focused on on targeting the the key experiential components of emptiness. So, for example, we were looking to see that that participant hadn't confused emptiness with the idea of non-existence or the or, or a nihilistic type approach. We wanted them to understand, we wanted to see that they understood that emptiness means that phenomena exist in the sense that we see them, we're not denying that, but that they exist in perhaps a less concrete manner than, than most people might le- might um, have, have led themselves to believe. So it, it, was, it was a fairly a, a subtle process of, of inquiry. I see that, in effect, you're wearing two hats. You are a research psychologist on the one hand and a meditation teacher on on the other hand. And uh, it seems to me from your description that you're quite comfortable with those two roles, that they don't really conflict with each other. I, I, I think there's good compatibility because... Um, I think really you have you have to have some understanding of the techniques in order to research it well, um, and then one tries to tries to use various processes, various bracketing off processes, in order to to keep one's own perspective um, apart from others as much as possible. What we did here was we compared participants' responses to that screening questionnaire to a very encompassing pan-Buddhist perspective of emptiness, a very, um, yeah, a very encompassing model that, that incorporated many different Buddhist views. And so really, if, if there wasn't at least a reasonable fit between their version of emptiness and the model we used, then, then, then probably there, there's, there's some, there's some issue somewhere. Uh, another uh, concern I have, or some people have expressed, is that there seems to be a uh, cultural distinction between Buddhism as practiced in the West by Westerners and Buddhism as, as practiced in the East by uh, people from the East. Uh, did you uh, notice any differences of that sort? Uh, did that come up at all as you were recruiting your subjects? I think you're right. I think there are those those cultural differences inevitably, but but when we're talking about insight-based techniques, that they, they they really ought to transcend those cultural differences. Emptiness is emptiness. It doesn't matter if you're if you're practicing from a Western Buddhist or an Eastern Buddhist perspective. It doesn't even matter if you're practicing from a, a non-Buddhist perspective. Essentially, the understanding is that that this is a truth of 
nature, truth of, of existence. And so, um, no, we, we didn't really see that with this particular group of advanced Buddhist meditators. So, and, and when you describe emptiness as a truth, I presume what you're saying is that in the process of meditation itself, one is capable of discovering that truth. That's the intention. The intention is to, to develop a certain degree of focus and awareness of meditative concentration and then to begin investigating the true nature of self, for example, in, in particular, um, participants or, or, or advanced meditators often try to search for something that they can call me, mine or I or self that exists inherently and independently. And no matter how hard they, they look, they, they, they never find that separately and inherently existing self. And, 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 and it's... And it's from that point of view, I, I'm using the word truth. Well, let's talk about the results of your study. I guess that a after a year in the recruitment process, you found uh, about 25 meditators who uh, met your criteria for, for this study. And uh, then what happened? That's right. Um, then those um, meditators were, were asked to um, engage in their own time, in a natural way, in, in the practice of um, eliciting emptiness in meditation. And they were also asked to um, practice a mindfulness-based meditation that didn't involve any, any emptiness-based um, techniques or concepts. And before, immediately before and immediately after each of those two types of meditation, the participants were asked to, to fill in, to complete a series of uh, psychometric tests. And, and then we looked at differences before and after um, each meditation and, and how they compared across the two meditation conditions within the same group of participants. I, I'm assuming that uh, you would expect that before uh, the meditation, uh, that when they took the psychometric tests, there would be very little difference before a mindfulness meditation and before an emptiness meditation. W would that be correct? That's that's precisely correct. So we we, we actually ran some uh, some tests to check that there weren't any. Uh, uh, significant differences between uh, the start points for both types of meditation and, and, um, and there weren't in, in this case, there weren't any differences identified. So then you're going to be primarily then looking at the differences uh, that are found after uh, each of these meditations. And, and I guess to uh, sort of short circuit, I guess you found that while both uh, mindfulness and emptiness showed a variety of positive benefits, the, uh, there was a significant difference between the two. That's right. So we found that um, that emptiness meditation outperformed mindfulness across all of the outcome variables that we used in this study, which were um, measures of non-attachment to self, of compassion, of uh, of mystical experience, and of positive and negative feelings. Let's talk a little bit now about uh, what the experience of emptiness was like as reported by these meditators? Sure. So another, um, another study element that we introduced was um, an interview um, where, we, where we asked questions really to try and tap into that experiential component rather than just focus on, on data elicited from, from uh, uh, psychometric tests. And... Um, it seemed that all participants really, really felt that emptiness meditation was their main source of spiritual insight, if you, if you like. They, they described it using terms such as um, it, it provides them with a spiritual reboot, um, a form of, of re-energizing, of reconnecting with the 
what they believe to be the innermost nature of their mind. How would that compare to uh, the experience that they reported in engaging in mindfulness? That they typically report a calming, a focusing, a, 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 a concentration increase following mindfulness meditation and those those benefits are excellent uh, to be more to be more focused in the present moment to feel to feel calmer um, but but there's a, an element of insight that's often missing from from mindfulness practice alone that insight into um, how we exist and and where we exist mindfulness practice alone doesn't really um, engage with those those types of questions or techniques. And I presume from everything we've discussed so far, all of these practitioners were uh, deeply engaged already in Buddhist practice. So one might say they, they were all very familiar with the Buddhist uh, concepts uh, to the extent that one could call it a theology with Buddhist theology and, and philosophy. So uh, did you make any effort to sort of tease out the experiential component from the potential for indoctrination that, that occurs in, in any social organization i think to a degree yes but i think you're, you're touching on, on on a limitation of of the study because as you've correctly said um this was a an entirely buddhist uh participant sample and yet those those buddhist meditation practitioners came from very diverse and different buddhist schools that that actually have very very different views on on meditation um at, at least theoretically on even on on on, on emptiness um and, and a related concept such as non-self there's very differing views and so uh, to that extent yes we found that the, the the experiential content that we reported was reflective of all participants regardless of which particular Buddhist um, school they, they came from. There were some minor differences, of course, um, but, you're, but you're quite right. I think an important next step would be to, to bring on board um, non-Buddhist um, uh, contemplative practitioners who, who I understand have very similar experiences, perhaps using different, different terms, and, and see if we're still tapping into the precise same emptiness construct. You know, one of um, the paradoxes to me that came up in your research is the idea that your uh, meditators reported that while experiencing emptiness, they also felt that they were in control of the meditative process. And uh, that strikes me as a paradox, because if, if you're saying, well, there is no self, yet who's in control? Um, yes, I think that the important thing from from that particular study observation to take away is that emptiness wasn't a form of em emptiness meditation wasn't a form of zoning out or tuning or, or, or tuning out. Part participants remained aware of that experience. They were they were they were in control of the meditation. They could choose when to terminate that meditation. They were they were very present and very aware they were aware of um of of themselves but they were they were aware of a, of a very different way of relating to self it's not that the self ceases to exist in the sense that um, this body is, is no longer here um it, it exists but it's a much more encompassing um notion and 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 when one when one lets go of self in the in the ego sense of the word a much more dynamic a much more broader and encompassing notion of self emerges that according to this and other studies is is much more flexible much more capable of coping with change much less likely to get fixed in in narrow ways of thinking so 
um, that's the type of uh, um, self, more adaptive type of self that I think participants were, were beginning to um, identify with in the meditation. I think another interesting finding uh, that you came up with is that, that the profundity, the intensity of the emptiness experience seemed unrelated to the length of the meditative practice itself. We, we interpreted that as, um, as being consistent with participants' reports that whilst dwelling in emptiness, while having this experience, they they really transcended concepts of time and space. They, they lost track of time. There was no longer any time um, as far as they were concerned. And so therefore the, the length of time they, they meditated for was, 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 less, in, was less important than, um, than, than the insights that they derived whilst, whilst, whilst in that state of meditation. Would it also be the case that the uh, length of time that they had spent uh, practicing meditation, I mean, the number of years they've been in meditative practice, had any uh, impact on the profundity of the meditative experience? To a degree, one would expect to see that, but, but not necessarily. Um, there are instances, I think, of, of individuals really just being able to connect with this practice quite rapidly so i i'm not a big uh um believer that um meditation skill necessarily corresponds to years spent in training uh, although as i recall uh, from our discussion of of the sister study you did that the the average person in your study probably had been meditating for over 10 years yes these individuals in this study and the sister, sister study um, were, were classed as advanced meditators. They had undergone a significant amount of training in order to to elicit these experiences. But I, I think uh, the quality of that training is much more important than the quantity with regards to meditation. Well, I want to thank you once again so much for being with me. You're doing fascinating work. I know that uh, meditation research has really uh, come into a new phase, and you're at the forefront of it. So uh, I'm very, very happy to uh, share your ongoing research with our viewers. William, thank you so much for being with me. Thanks. Thanks for having me with you again, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you.